Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. Maliki Yawmidin. But what does it actually mean to be a Muslim? What does it mean to take your life and submit it to the will of God? Because this is what we are saying when we say it. So today, inshallah, I'd like to tell you of my voyage from missionary to Muslim. Now, missionary and Muslim seem these days to always be at loggerheads with each other. So what was a missionary doing looking at Islam in the first place? Well, to tell you the truth, I wasn't looking for Islam. Islam found me. And so to try and explain how my transition from, uh, to Islam or my transition from Christianity to Islam took place, or I need to perhaps do a bit of a background. Uh, let's go back in time and have a look what, what happened in the early stages of my life. Now, some of you may have heard my story before and know how I embraced Islam. But often when we, we tell our stories, or uh, many people who tell their stories on how they've embraced Islam, because of time restraint, they never really get to tell you this, the full story. So inshallah today, um, this uh, series will deal with my transition to Islam. And in this series, we'll look at not only how I became a Muslim, but some of the deceit and deception that is used amongst the missionaries today to bring uh, Muslims to Christianity. Now there's a statistic, and whether the statistic is accurate or not, it's still one that needs to be looked at. And according to an Al Jazeera television broadcast uh, some years ago, that over 6 million people from Africa revert from Islam to Christianity. Now this might be a shocking statistic and you might think that this is impossible to happen. But if we have a look around us, we see that all the time we see people um, leaving different faiths to go and join other faiths. But the good news is that Islam is growing at 2.8%. So what we see is each year at 2.8% we are growing faster than any of the other religions in the world. Again, this is a statistic that probably will change by the time you watch this. And so we have to continuously look and see what new information has been brought up. But we do see that Islam is definitely growing. Now, why are 6 million people leaving Islam for Christianity every year in Africa? Well, there are a number of reasons. One can be because they are getting relief and help from Christian organizations, and the uh, help is only given if you convert or revert to Christianity. The second reason that, that people may be converting in such a large number is because the teachings are not there. In other words, we as Muslims are not doing our job properly, which means we need to make sure that we have classes, we have educational facilities available, not just to, to teach the basics of Islam, but also to encourage Muslims to stay strong in their faith. Because no one would want to trade down. No one would want to go backwards, they would want to progress. And so anyone who is a Muslim and wants to go backwards, it would be the same as speaking to a Christian and saying to a Christian, would you like to become a Jew? Of course the Christian would not like to become a Jew. He sees Judaism as the first stone, or the first stone and the stepping stone to success. And the next step that a Christian needs to take is to realize that Jesus had come. And so for Christians, it's very simple to know that they're no longer under the Abrahamic covenant, but now under the covenant of Jesus. So peace be upon the prophet Isa, peace be upon him. Christians would understand that quite simple. It's quite a simple step. They see that they go from Judaism to Christianity. Now from Christianity, the next logical step is Islam. So someone who is a Muslim wouldn't really want to go backwards. It wouldn't make any sense. But there are people doing it. And the only reason they can be doing it is for one or two or the third reason would be the reason that they are receiving pressure from the community they are living in. Whatever the reason might be, we might never know. And Allah knows best. But whatever the reason is, we can, as Muslims, make sure that we look after the people that are Muslims and make sure that they are practicing Muslims make sure they understand why they have committed themselves to Islam in the first place. But let's get back to the topic on hand today. And the topic on hand is my transition from missionary to Muslim. So I was born many, many light years ago for many of the younger viewers that are watching. I was born in 1967. In 1967, lots of interesting things were going on in history. I was born on the 13th of July, which makes it probably for some people an unlucky day. But for me, I think it was a lucky day. Uh, I had ordained this day for me to be born, and so I knew that it has to be a, a special day because this is the day that Allah had chosen for me. Incidentally, one of the people that was instrumental in me becoming a Muslim was born on the 1st of July, 
And uh, so I suppose being born in the same month as him was, was quite a privilege for me. Now in July of 1967, many things were going on in, in the world. And in Palestine, the whole issue of division of land was coming to a loggerhead. There was lots of fighting going on. In America, the first interracial marriages were permitted. And throughout the world, there was great upheaval because people were starting to uh, look for themselves and trying to find themselves. The hippie era was uh, at its highest peak. Drugs, rock, rock and roll, sex was at its highest peak. People were doing illicit things. People were taking drugs, trying to find peace and harmony in the world. So the world was, in one way, people were trying to find meaning. In another way, there was just, it was a very, very destructive time to be alive. So I was born into this, this time where everybody was worried about what was going to happen. Did they have a future? When would somebody push the button that would send off an atom bomb and kill everybody in the world? So there's a lot of terror and fear in the world at that time. Now, when I was born, I was born into a family that were pretty liberal-minded, which means they allowed us to make our own decisions in life pretty young, from a very young age. Um, I, unfortunately, was the last one in the family to be born, and so for being the last one, um, I suppose I got away with a lot more than anyone else in my family did. But one of the things that I did enjoy was where I went to school. In my early school years, I used to go to school on the horse every day. Now, we lived in quite a rural area, uh, quite a, a backward area, and so I used to take a horse and I used to go to preschool every day on the back of a horse. So I learned to horse ride at a very, very young age. Loved horse riding. I really had a, an affinity, a, a feeling that, you know, this is a beautiful animal and enjoyed horse riding. And even today, I still do a lot of horse riding. So it's one of my hobbies or sports. And so as I used to go to school, I used to pass by people in their motor cars or walking. And I'd feel so grand because I'd be on my horse. And uh, when I went to preschool, I had issues that I didn't uh, really understand. One of the problems I had right on was that uh, we had to do a play at school. And one of these plays that we had to do at school, a show that we had to do at school, was a story of Adam and Eve. And my part in, the, in this uh, play was I had to be Adam. And so I met the Eve that I was going to be uh, acting next to. And we had all these shepherds and all the other people that had to be in this play. And one of the problems I had is I happened to ask one of the teachers, did Adam have a belly button? And of course, she looked at me and said, we don't ask questions like that. And I said, why not? And she said, well, this is this, just act, don't worry. Don't ask questions like that. You'll know when you get older. One of the funny things is I never, ever got that answer to that question. You see, from a young age, I started to look at things theologically. I wanted to know the reason for things. Did Adam have a belly button or not? And if he didn't have a belly button, that means he didn't have an umbilical cord, which means he was created. So why in all the pictures that we see with, that I saw later in Christendom, did Adam have an umbilical cord marking or a belly button? So these were, this was the beginning of my theological inquiry. And so my, many of you might think this is a funny thing to, to ask questions about. But a belly button is an interesting thing. I mean, why is it there? Why do we have one? Many people have given me an explanation. Some people will say that it's there where you put your salt in while you're sitting in bed watching a film and you eat celery. So I don't know if it's supposed to be something that you put salt in. I don't know if it's a place that you rest your book on what it's there for, but Allah decided it was something that we needed to have. And of course, if you uh, understand medicine, it's so important because this is how we get nutrition and food. But back then, I needed a theological answer. I wanted an answer from the Bible. And I was, what, four or five years old when I asked this question, and I needed an answer. So this was something that I needed an answer for. So I never really received one, and so I left it alone because I realized I wasn't going to get an answer from anyone in the preschool days or my nursery school days. So I left this question um, unanswered. So as I went uh, through preschool, I learned that many things that uh, I didn't have answers for, I wasn't going to get. And I thought, well, maybe they, there's too many young people or too many children around, and, and adults thought that this is not a question that they should answer such a young boy about. You know, many people kept lots of secrets about many things. So I thought, okay, this is something that I'll maybe find out as I got older in life. So I left the belly button thing behind me. Now, my parents thought it would be a good idea for me to be the only child in the whole family that went to a Catholic school. Now, any of you who know anything about Catholic schools know that Catholic schools have their own way of doing things. And one of the ways of doing things is beating the children. They believe that if you spare the rod, and you will definitely spoil the child. And so the nuns, or the, the ladies who looked after us in the convent, were very, very strict on us. Now, I remember the first day of going to school, I was very excited. I had my uniform on, everything was prim and proper, and I couldn't wait to go to school. And the first day as I got to school, there was a Catholic nun there. And her name was Rita. That was her name. And uh, when I got to her classroom, to the front of the classroom door, she, put her, she looked at me very sternly, frowned at me, and she said, Sister Rita. And I looked at her and I thought, whoa, she's got a deep voice for a woman. 
So I didn't worry too much about it, and I looked at her, and she said it again. And I looked at her and I said, uh, no, Sister Beverly. And she said, no, Sister Rita. I said, no, Sister Beverly. So we had an argument. So I looked at her, I was very confused, and I said, no, I have a sister. My sister's name is Beverly. And she said, no, I'm not your sister, sister, I'm your sister. I was confused already, I didn't know what to think. How can I have a sister that I didn't know of, and now I've only been introduced to her? And she explained to me quite clearly that there's two different types of sisters. There's a sister that is your God-made sister, and there's a sister that is your biological sister. I thought, okay, I got it, no problem. You're my sister that God made for me, and my sister at home is another one that God made for me, but we can't explain it in the same way. So I was lost. I had a big theological issue, number two. I had a sister that I didn't know of that was created by God, not the same way as my other sister who was created by God was made. So I had a problem. So I went into the classroom. I thought, okay, let me not rock the boat. Let me not have any problems. This is already going to be a, a troubled year as it is. As we sat in the class, a few hours later, a man walked in and he said, my name is Father Bonadenka. Now I was shocked. Now I really was about to fall off my chair. Now I had a sister that I never knew of, and now I have a father I don't know of. And so when this man said he is my father, I said, but I have a father. And he said, no, I am your father. I said, no, you're not. I have a father at home. And so the argument went on and then eventually he explained, I am a father given to you by God, like you have a father that you have at home, but he's different. Very confused, very confusing for a young boy. And so... I got more and more confused and asked more and more questions that didn't have answers for it. When we get back from the short break, I will continue telling you of more of the confusion in the first years of school. Walking in this great big world, in this great big world, I gazed in awe. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the second part of the first series and this uh, interesting look into my life and how I became a Muslim. How I reverted from Christianity to Islam and the voyages and the experiences that I went through. Now, what I was saying in the last part is that I was introduced to a sister that wasn't my sister and a father that wasn't my father. But I was told by the church that these were my father and my sister because God had made them my father and my sister. But I was very confused because my parents had told me that God had made my sister and my mother and my father for me. So it became very confusing. So eventually somebody during the playtime, one of the, the rest periods in the school, somebody came to me and said during the break, you know, this is not really your sister and not really your father. These are just priests and nuns, and they are there to, to guide us and show us. And I said, but why do we call them sister and father? Of course, they didn't have a, a valid reason for it. They just said, well, that's the way it is, and don't ask questions. And so once I had, uh, had discovered that I was now going to have an extended family of sisters and fathers all over the world, I thought, well, this maybe will be a good idea. I'm going to have like lots of brothers and sisters and fathers and, and all the rest of it. So... After the break, uh, when we finished our recess period in the school and I went back to the classroom, I asked the sister if I have any brothers because I've got sisters and I've got a father. Don't I have any more brothers and mothers? And of course, I got a hit on the back of the head and told not to be insolent. So this was the beginning of my search into theology. Every time I asked a question that made sense or a question that they didn't have answers for, I got hit on the back of the head. So this is something I learned very quickly. Don't ask too many questions, you're going to get into trouble. About two or three weeks later in the first year of school, we were taken to church for the first time and showed how the church runs, what we must do when we walk into the church. Now, the first thing that we needed to do when we walked into the church was to do the following. We needed to dip our hands into a little bowl of water and make the sign of the cross against our body. And this was going to protect us. This was a form of ablution that would be done every time we went into the church. Now, first of all, I didn't know what was so special about that water that, they, that there was in the front of the church because they said if you didn't do it, the service wouldn't be blessed. So I went along with it, and there was no explanation, no explanation why, why it happens or what we're doing while we're doing it. So I went in and I did this uh, like a robot without thinking and without, without having any knowledge of what I was doing. The next thing that came along was that we were sitting in the chairs in the pews in the church, and we were looking at the front of the church, and in the front of the church there were two boxes, a box on the left and a box on the right with two doors. And they were quite dark little rooms, and what the priest told us when we were sitting there in front of everybody in, in, inside the in the church, all the children were sitting there, and the priest would explain to us what happens at different parts of the church. And he pointed towards these boxes, and he said, this is where I'll go. I'll go into the left side of the box, and on the right side of the box is where you'll go. And when you commit a sin or you do anything wrong, you'll come to confession, and you'll confess your sin to me, and I will forgive you your sin, and your sins will be forgiven. So I raised my hand, which I know I shouldn't have done, and asked the priest, why am I confessing to you? Because you're not God. And of course, you knew what happened then, I got a hit on the back of the head. 
Don't ask questions, just listen. So I listened. The priest went on to tell us that every time we commit a sin and we do not confess that sin to the priest, and if we die, we will go to a burning, living hell where we will torture, where we'll be tortured and suffer for all eternity with no hope of reprieve, no hope of, of salvation, we'll be lost forever. So the next thing I did is raise my hand again and I said, when can I come and confess? And of course the priest looked at me and said, you're too young to confess, you first have to do your Holy Communion. It means you have to go wait to a certain period of time where you could learn about the church's teachings and the church's doctrines. And once you've done your first Holy Communion, when you get to a certain age, then only can you go and do your first Holy Communion and then only can you go to from confession. So now I was really worried because what happens if I die tomorrow? Does that mean I haven't had a chance to confess my sins to the priest and I'm going to burn in this living hell forever and ever and ever? And so I was very anxious and I went to the priest and I said, please, can I go to confession? He said, no, you have to first do your Holy Communion. And when I asked him what would happen to me, he didn't have an answer because there is no answer. So you can see I had lots and lots of confusion right from the beginning before things had even started. So confession was a big problem for me, but the confession box became my new home. You see, what happened when the, the teachers got tired of beating me and hitting me and pulling my hair and smacking me for asking theological questions they had no answers for, my new home became the confession box in the church. So what they would do is they'd send me to the confession box, they'd lock the door and they'd leave me there. Now the confession box is a dark place. There's no lights or anything. So every time I did something wrong or was badly behaved, this became my new home. So I spent a lot of time in this confession box and it became like I had timeshare there. I had frequent flyer miles in the confession box. And so while I'd sit in the confession box, I'd think about questions. I would think about things that, that I needed answers for. I would think about, for example, one day the priest told us that there is a bottle of wine that he takes and he pours it into a jug, a silver jug, and he puts the silver jug on the altar. And there's a bag of bread that he opens and he puts the bread into a silver bowl. And he takes these two things and he holds them up in the course of the church service. And this is called communion. And the wine that we saw in the bottle that was bought from a shop suddenly turns into the real blood of Jesus. And the bread that he bought from a shop turns into the real body of Jesus. So the bread suddenly somehow changed into flesh and this water or this wine that was mixed with vinegar somehow turned into real blood. And so for me, this was terrifying. And I was thinking, how would people want to go to a church where they're going to learn to be vampires and, and cannibals? They're, they're going to be cannibalistic and we're going to be eating human flesh and we're going to be drinking blood of a human. This, this scared me and terrified me. So when I was asked later, in, as I grew older and I did my first Holy Communion, or I was ready now to take communion for the first time and go to confession for the first time, I made sure I was nowhere to be seen. I ran for the hills and I didn't want not to run and drink human blood and I definitely didn't want to eat human flesh. Even though they told me this is spiritual blood and spiritual flesh, there was Jesus' blood and Jesus' uh, flesh, I still didn't want any part of it. I wasn't going to buy into eating raw meat and eating someone's blood. And still today, i tell you what, when I eat meat, it has to be well, well, well done. I don't want to see any blood. So one thing the Catholic Church did really well for me is teach me to eat my meat well cooked. And by the way, I don't eat much meat. Meat is not good for you. You can eat it, but eat it in moderation. So... As the years went by, the priest realized that I was going to be a problem child. And they realized that this child is not going to get it. He's going to ask questions. He's going to be rebellious his whole life when it comes to theological issues. And so what happened is one of the priests said, I've got an idea for this child. He's going to become an altar boy. Now, an altar boy means I serve in the church as a baby priest in a way. So what I do is I help her whenever there's a church service. I help prepare the altar. I pour the wine into the, the silver chalice. I take the bread out of the packet and put it into the silver plate, put that on the altar. Sometimes during the service, you'd have to ring a bell. You'd be, you'd be basically helping the priest in whatever he needs to be done uh, during the service. And so this was my new job. I became like a little mini priest, mini me. And so I used to have a special outfit, which looked strangely enough very similar to this, but it was a gray one. I used to have a big rosary around my neck and I would go off. And I liked the rituals, but I didn't like what was being preached. I liked the idea that you needed to be committed that you need to do things at a certain time and a certain way every single week. But I didn't like what was being taught because I just found there was no evidence for it. No one was explaining anything to me. They were just saying, this is the way it's done and this is the way it will continue to be done. So for years, I continued as an altar boy in the church. I really believed in what I was following and I thought this is definitely, you know, something that I enjoy doing, something definitely I'd like to learn more about. But I had a problem with the doctrines or the lessons that were being taught. Now, in around about seven or eight years old, I had this dream. And in this dream, it was a reoccurring dream because I had it many times over and over and over. 
And our scientists have done a study on people who have reoccurring dreams, and we found that many people have reoccurring dreams. They say that people who wake up be just be before REM sleep or after REM sleep when you go into your next uh, sleep cycle, these are the people who are most likely to have reoccurring dreams. Whatever the scientific purpose might be or the scientific reason might be for, for reoccurring dreams, I'm not sure. But in this dream that I had, this reoccurring dream that I had many, many times as a young boy, I used to have this dream that I was, being, I was floating. And many people have dreams of flying or floating and have that experience. You know what? It feels like a very strange feeling. But in this dream, I dreamt that I was floating up through different layers of heavens. And to me, I knew there were heavens because they were beautiful and was nothing like I'd ever seen here. Some people say there were different levels or different layers of clouds or whatever. But to me, I knew very, very clearly from a young age that there were seven heavens. And as I went through these seven heavens, I could hear people singing. And they were singing in a language or, or chanting in a language I'd never heard before. And they're all dressed in white robes and all, everyone looked so happy and so serene. And they were chanting the same thing over and over and over again, and I didn't know what it meant. So I went to my priest the next day, and I said to the priest of my church, what is this dream about seven heavens and this chanting? And of course, the reaction was, boof, on the back of the head. We do not believe in seven heavens. There's only one heaven. And so the whole way through life, I had this idea that there were seven heavens. And I had an idea that this chanting that I heard had some type of meaning. So I asked a couple of other people from other denominations. Of course, they said the same thing within Christendom. There's only one heaven. And I, I tried to find out what the meaning was. So I spoke to a woman who knew Latin in my church. And I said to her, what does this uh, la, 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 la mean? And she said, well, she has no idea, but it might be Latin or it might be Aramaic or it might be Greek. She doesn't know what it is. Uh, but I mustn't worry too much about that. It's just a dream and leave it as a dream. So I, I, I continue to live through my life and not worry about it. And so I wanted to find, in a way, I wanted to find what this meant, but I didn't worry too much about it. I left it. So this, this chanting, this story, and this layers of heaven, I really wanted it. It really bothered me. I really wanted to have an answer for it, but not to the extent where I gave up everything else to in search of, of the answer for this. So it always remained at the back of my mind. Now, as I got older and I went to school, um, left, the, left the Catholic school and went into a normal secular school with normal secular teaching, I found for the first time that I understood what was going on in the world. And so I started to look at politics. Now, I come from South Africa, and so politics is a very important part of our lives and a very important part of our upbringing. Now, I never knew there was any difference from me to anybody else because of the color of my skin or pigmentation. It was only as I, I got older and... Um, I remember one day sitting at the bottom of my garden and I watched the, the ants moving from one nest to the other. And I saw the little red ants and the black ants. They were fighting with each other. And I think it was because they were fighting over food or maybe they were raiding each other's nests or whatever the reason, I don't know. And the lady who looked after me, the lady who care, was my caretaker and looked after me when my parents weren't around, she was an African woman, a Zulu-speaking woman from my country. And she pointed at these ants and she said to me, this is what's happening in our country. And I looked at her quite vaguely and like, what do you mean by this? And she said, the black ants and the red ants are like the black people and the white people in this country. And there's a war and there's a fight going on. And I was shocked and I said, but why are they fighting? And she said to me, because of the color of the skin. And I couldn't get it and I didn't understand. And I thought, how can people fight because of the color of their skin? Now... I'm going to go into more depth about my political um, understandings and how politics had such a role to play in my reversion or conversion from Christianity. And inshallah, in the next episode, we'll continue to look at my reversion and how it took place and look more in depth at how it can apply to maybe even you so you can think about how you can be a better Muslim, inshallah. So from me, Arib Islam, until next time, assalamu alaikum. Islam, my dear, Islam, my dear, Allah, my Lord.